Hello, thank you for joining us. I am Taro Leppanen for the Australian Institute of International Affairs. I am here today with Professor Greg Austin, who is a professorial fellow at the East West Institute in New York and also a, a visiting professor at the Australian Centre for Cybersecurity at the University of New South Wales in Canberra. He's also the author of a recently published book, Cyber Policy in China. Professor Austin. Hello, Tara. Thank you for coming. Um, I would like to start by asking you to outline um, why cybersecurity has become such a major issue for national security policy. Thank you, Tara. Well, why, why, when we talk about cybersecurity, we're really talking about the security of information, which is contained in all of those information devices and networks that we use today, which we weren't using 20 or 30 years ago. So the entire revolution caused by the information age has led to a revolution in the security requirements of our personal information, how we transmit it and how we keep it safe. So what we're dealing with is something fundamentally new. So once upon a time we had to worry about the security of our persons and our belongings, our house perhaps, but once we adopted and started to move down the information superhighway, we let the rest of the world into our private lives, we let the rest of the world into the security of our family, uh, the, our health, our finances, and we have to now find a way of controlling the information superhighway and keeping it safe. Okay, thank you. And um, in regard to China, uh, the Chinese military has been widely linked to many cyber espionages for commercial purposes. Um, is China a leader in commercial cyber espionage or should we expect that since now we are in this information age um, all of the states are, are engaging in this kind of activity? Well, this is a very tough question. So commercial espionage is a fact of life for business globally. Uh, so whether or not that's conducted by state governments, uh, by states or by individuals um, is a very uh, important distinction. In the case of governments, it appears to be the case that China is the biggest perpetrator of cyber espionage worldwide against businesses and other governments. The United States government has made a case that China regularly steals sensitive commercial information and intellectual property and converts that to the benefit of, of its civil sector companies. Uh, you'll hear from me later in the presentation that this, this, this charge, this allegation, is open to serious question. There's no doubt that China and entities in China are collecting massive amounts of information, arguably more than almost any other country except the United States. Uh, and it's almost certain that some of that does flow through to Chinese civil sector companies. But the idea that the Chinese state apparatus, which is heavily oriented towards internal security espionage, and other forms of international security espionage, it's highly unlikely that they're taking a lot of time and a lot of effort to divert commercial, commercially sensitive information from the civil sector in the West to the civil sector in China. And in fact, I've done a detailed study of the United States charges and the United States main documents on this, uh, published in 2013 and 2014, reveal almost no evidence of Chinese government agencies taking commercially sensitive information and converting that to civil sector advantage. In 2013, the White House published a paper on economic espionage. It had 19 cases uh, of Chinese economic espionage against the United States, and in only one of those 19 cases did they say that there was state involvement, uh, unambiguous state involvement. And in almost all of the cases, probably all of the cases, there's no strong evidence of the transfer of the information to the commercial advantage of a single Chinese civil sector company. So the evidence is there, it's in black and white. What the United States has presented uh, is not convincing. Uh, that's not the same as saying it isn't happening in that way, but so far the United States hasn't been able to put it into the public domain. A second point that goes with that is that it's highly unlikely that the Chinese government would be able to engineer this massive cyber espionage from private sector companies in the United States and convert it to civil sector uses in China. That is a massive task in itself, bearing in mind that China has access, through legal means, to 95% of United States technology 
and 95% of intellectual property through licensing. So a Chinese company can go to an American company and say, will you license the production of your technology in China? So there is this massive transfer of wealth from the United States, from Europe, from Japan to China, massive transfer of technology through lawful means, and it's been the Western policy for 30 years that that should happen. So the idea that somehow China is able to get much more through covert means, and it's actually getting through overt means, really doesn't stand up to much scrutiny. Uh, that's very interesting. How then, um, in that respect, what are the reasons um, behind these um, United States um, implications that this is actually start Chinese state-led espionage? Well, there is no doubt that uh, information is flowing from Chinese intelligence agencies to corporations uh, who are in competition with Chinese corp with, with American corporations. So the United States is under quite a bit of pressure, the United States government is under quite a bit of pressure to dampen that competition from China. And so if you look at the uh, allegations that the United States brought against five PLA personnel for their involvement in economic espionage, it involved companies like Westinghouse Nuclear, which is in fact not just a civil company, it produces military reactors for the United States. Uh, its partner in China is not just a civil company, it is the absolute epicenter of all civil and military nuclear development in China. So you've got Westinghouse, a dual-use company, civil and military, already selling nuclear reactors and already transferring technology to China through an agency that's deeply involved in civil and military sectors in China. So you've got this very complex picture. The United States is arguing that these Chinese intelligence agencies have stolen information from Westinghouse given it to the Chinese nuclear administration and Chinese nuclear administration is using that for the civil economy in a way that damages Westinghouse. Well, that doesn't really stand up to much scrutiny because West Westinghouse has signed a big technology transfer agreement with the Chinese nuclear administration. It's already building four reactors in China four power stations in China. There are plans for Westinghouse to participate in contracts on at least uh, 12 to 20 new reactors in China. So the idea that Westinghouse business is suffering because of the theft by the Chinese military intelligence of this information really doesn't stand up. The bigger problem, and this is really of serious concern, it was mentioned in an interview uh, just recently by the head of the uh, National Security Agency, but it was also mentioned two years ago by President Obama. The United States is deeply worried about Chinese penetration of the United States financial system, Chinese civil aviation, and Chinese electricity group, uh, and, and United States uh, electricity groups. So there's a mix of concern in the United States, partly economic, but partly uh, this scale a scale of cyber espionage against the civil sector which the United States doesn't quite understand. So on the one hand the United States wants to make sure that the Chinese somehow get their cyber activities in United States systems under control and don't do any serious damage that they didn't mean to. But on the other hand they want to make sure that they can protect United States jobs where they are being challenged. It's just that the United States hasn't made the case very well that there is this civil sector espionage going on that is being put into the Chinese civil sector in a way that makes the United States civil sector corporations uncompetitive. So that's the, you know, that's ahead of the United States if they want to continue with this strategy. But just as a quick footnote to that, President Xi Jinping of China will go to the United States in September and just last week President Obama and Xi Jinping had a phone call and they agreed that they would try and make progress on the issue of cyber security. So what transpires in United States policy and in Chinese policy in the months leading up to that September visit, uh, it will be very interesting to see. And I think we'll see movement from both sides to a more cooperative position. Excellent. And is there then, um, what are your views on the future of um, cyber diplomacy? So will we then, if there's already cooperation, possible cooperation now happening in September between China and US, um, is there then possibilities of a future of a um, regime, a global governance regime or in cyberspace? Well, the likelihood of a globally agreed governance regime that is anything but 
uh, 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 allowing for freedom of the internet, that will never happen. The Western countries will never agree to any sort of global governance regime. But all countries in the world have an interest in secure operation of the internet. Uh, all countries have a vested interest in stopping cyber crime, especially uh, cyber crime involving protection of children. So the United States and China will find increasingly common ground in that area. But cooperation between the United States and China on even those cyber issues has been very slow to develop. It's gathered pace in the last two years, but it um, uh, is still hostage to this bigger situation of, of confrontation and tension between China and the United States. But my prediction is that, as we've seen in this phone call between Xi and Obama just this past week, we will see a more rapid move to cooperation on both sides. Uh, we will never get China to stop cyber espionage. We will never get the United States or Australia to stop cyber espionage. But the important thing is making sure that we can control the more negative outcomes. And we have to control any theft of intellectual property where it is being converted to the competitive advantage of Chinese companies, French companies. Apart from China, the three countries which the United States has named as big in commercial espionage are Russia, France and Israel. So in public, in 2011, the United States named China, France, Russia and Israel as the four biggest perpetrators of, cyber, of, of commercial espionage by cyber means. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and if we then move from um, business and commerce to more military strategy, how much would you say has the evolution in cyber capabilities influenced modern warfare? Well, modern warfare, from the United States point of view, is predominantly about cyberspace issues. Uh, it's about the application of advanced information and communications technologies to every single sphere of military operations. The United States alone in the world is capable of doing that. Uh, countries like China, uh, Russia t to a lesser extent, but, but both China and Russia are relatively backward in the military applications of uh, cyberspace and information and communications technologies to modern warfare. So if, you, if you, you had a war between the United States and the United States, modern warfare would be all about cyberspace issues and information technologies. If you had a war between China and the United States, the United States would be fighting it from the point of view of information dominance. The Chinese would be fighting it from the point of view of information dominance. But the Chinese don't have the technology to back that up. So the China would be looking for what they call asymmetric strategies and asymmetric combat operations to degrade and undermine the overwhelming advantage that the United States and its allies enjoy in what the United States regards as modern information warfare. Okay, excellent. And, um Asking for um, if the United States has such a predominant position with information yeah. technology, what is China's current state in its development with international information technology? Well, it's a very good question. The, uh, China has slipped in international competitiveness in the last five years, uh, as measured by the World Economic Forum's global uh, information sorry global information network readiness index and the, uh, it slipped, in fact, from 36th to 62nd in four years. Uh, Russia is in an equally bad position, or worse position. It's slipped, uh, it's actually at 100th. China is actually at 62nd. Finland is first. <laughs> uh, the United States is ranked seventh. So um, according to all, all, all reasonable studies of international uh, comparisons between countries like China and the United States uh, and Chinese studies of China's position relative to the United States, they're pretty much in agreement that China is in a very weak position, well, a much weaker position than the United States. And it is reflected quite well in the different indexes that have been published, whether it's from uh, the United Nations uh, uh, or from World Economic Forum or from Chinese specialists. Okay, fantastic. And my final question would be on, um, in the current state, um, what kind of challenges does China's cyber capabilities pose for Australia? if any? Well, there are positive challenges and negative challenges. <laughs> Let's start with the negative challenges. Clearly, China is a major actor in cyber espionage. Uh, it will knock on any door that it can find. The Chinese government will siphon up any piece of information it can find. The, the question that comes after that is, what does it do with it? Uh, 
we don't know fully. So we have to be very careful and we have to protect all of our systems against this unwanted intrusion uh, from a country with which we have important political differences and which is in some circumstances, such as a crisis over Taiwan or territorial disputes in the East China Sea, in some circumstances China might be our adversary. But for the most part, China is not our adversary. China is our trading partner. We engage in technology transfer with China. We teach them computer technology. China would have almost no computer technology if it were not for the Western countries today. We exported so much computer technology to China, it's almost unbelievable. You know, the, the China in 1976 came out of this massive uh, internal turmoil called the Cultural Revolution. Uh, it uh, was quite backward in science and technology. The United, the United States and other Western governments came to China's assistance and beginning in the late 1970s and early 1980s began a program and policy of large-scale technology transfer and investment. Today, two-thirds of China's exports of information and communications technology products come from foreign invested or foreign-owned factories. China would not be an ICP, ICT power that it is today, even a backward one, if it were not for large-scale foreign investment. So the challenge to Australia uh, in working with China in this cyber domain is to understand what are the threats and challenges, but to also to understand what are those very big opportunities that are out there. China's cyber security is very weak. So our cyber security industry has a great potential to go to China and work with them. Of course, there are challenges in that and they would have to be managed. But if you had to sort of say on a scale or a balance, mm. what's the uh, uh, relative weight of the threats versus the opportunities, the opportunities are way up here and the threats are, are less important. Okay, that is great to hear. Uh, so thank you so much for the interview and your insights. And it's going to be very interesting to see how states react and adapt um, in the changing cyber landscape. Thank you, Tara. And thank you for watching. If you would like to see Professor Austin's full presentation to the ACT branch of the Australian Institute of International Affairs or to access the Australian Outlook blog, please visit our website www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you very much.